Well, I'm back. <laughs> Give me one sec. All right. All right. Lesson learned from last time that I was up here. I will be holding this this time. That way everybody can hear me just fine and dandy. I feel like I got to work out with that song service right there. <laughs> I love it. I'm glad that it was Mike up there this time, and not me and Bo. Um, no offense to me or Bo in saying that. It's just, it's a lot better when Mike does it. So we're going to be continuing where we left off uh, last week in Hebrews. We're going to keep going. Um, Bo is, is traveling right now, so be in, in prayer for them as they are making their way back here. And Lord willing, they'll be back with us uh, next Sunday, and he'll be back up here picking up where I leave off. Hopefully not picking up the pieces, but just picking up where I left off. Um, so we're in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, we're going to be in verses 18 through 24. Um, question. I kind of doubt that I'll get a positive answer on this one, but question. Maybe somebody who's listening online, uh, who can now hear me, by the way. Um, might be able to answer yes to. Uh, has anybody ever been to Mount Everest in here? Anybody? No? Okay, I didn't think so. It's a long way away. And uh, if you've been to Mount Everest and you're listening online, you can comment or something down there and, and tell us that you've been there. <clears throat> and then if you've climbed it, you can comment that as well. But what's the one known fact that Mount Everest has? Seems like everybody knows this. What is it? It's the tallest mountain in the world, right? Wrong. It's not the tallest mountain in the world. I didn't know that until I was looking it up the other day. Okay, technically, it's the tallest mountain in the world that's above sea level, all right? So it's, it's 29,000 feet, which is about 5.5 miles high. So you can imagine how long that would take to like run it if you were just running straight up or in a straight line for that matter. It would take me days. Um, that's 16.5 football fields. So if you know football fields, that's 16 of them straight up in the air for Mount Everest. Now, the actual tallest mountain in the world, which is base to tip, all right, base to peak, that is a mountain in Hawaii, and I'm going to butcher this name probably, but I'm going to try it anyways, all right, uh, Mauna Kea, all right, that, how did I do? Did I do okay? I was all right. <laughs> that one is 6.3 miles high. So Mount Everest, 5.5 miles high. This one is 6.3 miles high. That's 19 football fields in the air, straight up. It's huge. All right, another interesting fact about Mount Everest, and you'll understand why I'm talking about Mount Everest in a minute here, but follow with me here. It'll cost you somewhere between $28,000 and $85,000 to climb Mount Everest. If you wanna go climb Mount Everest, you have to start saving now. <laughs> and the reason, I had no idea it cost this much. You just think, oh, I just show up to the mountain, right? I just walk up to it and I just start climbing. No, it's, it's very expensive to do it. Reason being, you've gotta pay for guides, okay? And the Sherpas, they're called, they cost lots of money to go up the mountain and take you there without hopefully dying. So. You might want to spend a little more on your Sherpa to ensure your percentages are higher of reaching the top and coming back down. Well, then you got camping equipment that you have to buy too. Oxygen, you need oxygen when you go up that high in the air, you have to strap on yourself. And then the travel costs because they have to take you to the base camp and whatnot from Mount Everest. So it's a very expensive trip. Uh, I was reading somewhere that it was, uh, it could be in the hundreds of thousands depending on what you buy and what you get to do it. So, another one, it takes roughly 10 weeks to climb it. I had no idea. And the reason being that it takes so long to climb it is because you have to go there and you have to practice training to climb it. Your body has to get acclimated to go up that high and not die. So you, you get to the base camp and you spend weeks there kind of making practice runs at it, going a little higher, going a little higher, coming back. Coming back, I think the record, oh man, I wish I would have wrote this down. The actual time it takes to climb the mountain was something, um, it's 
somewhere around like 12 hours or something like that to actually climb it. So it doesn't necessarily take you days to do it, but 12 hours of climbing is a lot. Approximately 5% of people die that attempt to climb the mountain. Interesting fact, usually it happens on the way down, not the way up, which is interesting. I didn't quite get all the details as to why on the way down, but something about the way down is more perilous than the way up. It tends to be avalanches, uh, like you fall into a cavern, and obviously it, when you're up that high in the air at Mount Everest, there's like a death zone, they call it. That's like when you got about like, I think it's like half a mile left to get to the top, they call it the death zone, and that's like where the oxygen is the lowest, and most people pass out and possibly die there or fall into a, a cave of some kind and you're, you, there's no getting you. There's no flying up there, really. Last one. There's 66% less oxygen in each breath at the summit of the mountain than at sea level. So guess what, Floridians? We're at sea level right now, pretty much. The summit of Mount Everest, it would take you basically two, over two breaths to equal one breath of air for you. So you can see why it takes training, oxygen depletion. Uh, there are people who have scaled Mount Everest without oxygen. They, they've done it, survived. Uh, one person made it up there. He passed out in that death zone. The, his crew left him because they thought he was dead. And you, that's what you do when someone dies in Mount Everest, you leave them. So he ends up waking back up 12 hours later and somehow makes it back down the mountain alive. He has a whole book and stuff you can go read on that guy. Um, quite amazing. So why, why do I tell us about Mount Everest? Why do I get to Mount Everest? Well, today we're going to be talking about a couple mountains of our own in Scripture. Uh, one mountain is going to leave you feeling scared and fearful. The other mountain is going to leave you feeling welcomed and joyful. <clears throat> now, before we go right into our passage, I want to make one other note, and that is context of what we've been studying. Don't forget it. This chapter 12 that we've been going through, the, the, really the central theme of chapter 12 has been joy and encouragement to continue through the hardships that you're going through in your life as a Christian because of what the hardships are and what God is doing through them. They're not pointless as a Christian. They come to you to build you up. And chapter 12 is teaching us that you don't you have, have endurance and go through it and continue on with hope of what God is doing. All right, so let's look at Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we're going to kind of get into it and break it down. All right, so... Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. Even if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of, righteous, of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood of that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So in this passage, we end up with two sections, all right? Just two simple sections. Both sections describe a different mountain, all right? And I'm going to try this, this passage. I don't know if you picked up on it as I was reading it. There are a lot of trees in this forest on this passage. You know how they talk about getting lost for the trees and not being able to see the forest? Well, this passage will get you like that if you don't take time to step back and really get the big picture view at the same time. So I'm going to try my best to kind of zoom in. We're going to view the trees and then zoom back out, get the big picture, get some good application out of this. So 
When we're studying the trees, bear with me a little bit, but I promise you, we'll come up for air, okay? Let's look at 18 through 21. This is the first mountain, all right? It says, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, and darkness and gloom, and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. Well, let me stop there and just say that this passage is being referenced back to the Old Testament, all right? Exodus 19, this is, this is Mount Sinai stuff we're talking about right here. And in Israel's history, they've already crossed the Red Sea, so they've escaped Pharaoh and his army. They've already whined about not having food, and they've been given manna. And then remember, they whined about the manna too, They're just a bunch of whiners. They whined already about the water and not having any, so they got it out of the rock from Moses. And they've already fought the Amalekites with Moses' hands being propped up. And remember, as his hands would droop, they would lose the battle. And as he was bring them up, they would start winning the battle again. And so finally, they were like, we got to get some props for this dude's arms so we stop losing because we can't lose this. So they prop Moses' arms up, and then they win the battle ultimately. So they've been through all of this, and now they end up in the wilderness of Sinai near Mount Sinai, right? So they're camped out in this wilderness area right here. That's what this passage is referencing, right? And I'm going to go back to it a couple times off and on so we can get a picture of it. They're about to get some major lessons in Old Testament theology is what's about to happen at Mount Sinai, all right? Dietary laws, priestly orders, tabernacle specifications, the Ten Commandments. They are getting ready to get blasted with Old Testament information, and they're going to fail miserably at keeping it. So let's look here. Let's look at a couple little trees here. For you have not come to what may be touched. First thing, we we need to know two things here. I want to note two things here. And the first is that the metaphor is continuing and moving forward. It says, for you have not come to. You see the idea? We're pushing forward. It's, It's in this whole chapter. It's talking about moving forward. You're moving towards a goal. So just note that this chapter isn't stagnant. It's not sitting in one place Christians are moving towards a goal. Humanity is moving towards a goal. All right, so keep that in mind. And then second, notice that this mountain could physically be touched. And just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. You can physically, you could physically touch this mountain. Let's keep going a little bit here. I had a thought and then it left me at the same time, so I'm stalling right now to see if you don't notice. You noticed. Let's look at this blazing fire stuff now. For you have not come to, and I'm adding that phrase in because of every one of these little sections that he dots where he says, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice, and it's implied that he's picking up off of that first section of wording that says, and you have not, for you have not come to. All right, so I'm going to put it in every single one just to keep it, keep it in our brains, keep reminding us. So, for you have not come to a blazing fire, darkness and gloom, a tempest, sound of a trumpet. The parallel here is Exodus 19. We go back in verse 18. I'm going to read it real quick for you. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. Imagine being there earthquake like all the time with a fire mountain thing in the background that must have been a joy to see so what do all these represent what 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 do we get out of this what can we get out of this well just note a couple things here the blazing fire thing well what do fires do if you light something on fire what happens to it 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 burns it up it eats it it's gone it, when your house catches on fire, it's, you're, you're left with pretty much nothing if it has its way. It eats everything up. Notice there that God is a consuming fire. Let's keep going. I don't want to get too bogged down in the trees, but there's a lot of them, and I want to give them justice. Um, darkness and gloom. How about that one? Well, darkness and gloom disorient a person, right? If you're in darkness, it's kind of disorienting depending on how dark it is and where you are. Um, it blocks people's vision, and darkness is, is unsettling. Has anybody ever gone like cave diving, and they go in the cave, and I've got like family who's done it, 
and you go in the cave and they take you down in and then they're like, all right, everybody turn your lights off. By the way, I haven't done this. I don't like the dark that much or caves for that matter. Um, but go in there and they turn all the lights off and you can't see your hand in front of your face because there is no light there. And it's an unsettling feeling for me. Uh, if I were in that situation, it would be. And then the disorientation. I mean, how many times you walk around your own house with the lights off and kick something or step on something that you shouldn't have? You get disoriented in darkness. So that's this mountain. That's Mount Sinai that we're talking about right now. There's a darkness over these people, over Israel right there. All right, tempests blow down and wreck ships, don't they? In Scripture, we see that. They, they blow things down. They wreck the ships. Paul was a victim of shipwreck and uh, others. Um, Floridians are pretty well acquainted with tempests. I know anybody else who's watching who might not be from Florida might not have as great a grasp of tempests as we have here in Florida, but we have hurricanes, and those are a really good example of a tempest. They come, you have to board your house up, or they blow the windows in, depending on where they hit. They're not fun. So, uh, you know, keep, keep building this idea, this mountain in your mind. It's, it's on fire. It's dark, uh, which seems odd, but you can picture it in your mind, covered in smoke, seeing fire in the smoke, um, the wind howling and blowing at the same time. Another thing, it says the trumpets. Well, what, what are the trumpets? I thought to myself, I was like, why trumpets? Why did he say trumpets? Like, what was the point of talking about the trumpets there? Because for us today, we kind of think of trumpets in just a musical sense. Like, we just really, that's, that's what we use trumpets for nowadays. But what about for the hearers back then? What would that have meant to them? Well, trumpets back then were used in the army big time. All right, Roman army, trumpets. They blew trumpets for almost everything in the army. If, it was, if they were in battle and they had to do a certain thing, they usually blew a trumpet to tell them what to do. Um, trumpets were also used as like alarms. Like we have alarms nowadays. We don't, you know, if somebody doesn't stand outside your house and with a trumpet and wait for a burglar to come in and then blow the trumpet, you know, to let you know that the burglar's here and the, the police come. We don't, we don't have that. So trumpets were, were really a, a signaling device of war and, and a, um, an alarm for the people. So imagine hearing the trumpet blowing back then. It would be like hearing tornado sirens right now today. That's the closest thing I can think of. They're unsettling and they're kind of scary. Thankfully, I actually haven't been in one of those situations yet. Hopefully, I never am. But um, it's an unsettling thing. So God was alarming his people. So you got the fire, the darkness, the gloom, the tempest blowing, the trumpet. Let's back out for a second here and get a view of the forest for the trees and not get too bogged down. What, what is the meaning behind all these pictures, these vivid pictures? Well, it was a visual, physical representation of God's power and holiness. And remember what holiness is. Holiness is separateness apart from sin and, and anything that isn't God, essentially. Um, so it's this visual, physical representation, mountain on fire, don't touch it, we're going to find out, or some bad things might happen to you. God was being very clear about his separation from fallen man at that point. Making sense so far? Not too bogged down? I know this is a lot. We're going to keep going. It's going to get better. The further I go in this message, the better it's going to get. I promise. Fingers crossed. Let's look at the next part here. He starts talking about the voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. And remember, add that little phrase inside in front of that. For you have not come to a mountain whose voice and words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. Even if a beast touches a mountain, it shall be stoned. And the parallel there is Exodus 20, 18. I'll read it real quick. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of trumpet and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, so basically you can picture a volcano almost, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood afar off and said to Moses, you speak to us, and we'll listen, but don't let God speak to us, lest we die. 
Imagine that phrase. They're so afraid of what's going on. Moses, you go. You go. Don't have God speak to us because we're afraid that he's going to crush us right now, right here. So let's notice two things out of this little section right here. I want us to notice the word endure. Now remember, the chapter has been talking about endurance this whole time, right? We've been talking about endurance for weeks now. Well, back in verse 1, last time I, I, I spoke on that little section right there, the word endurance was used, and it had the idea of uh, like getting underneath a trial of some kind and moving forward through it with a blazing hope, right? So that was that type of endurance. Well, this word, endurance, right here is not that word. It's not the same word. It has a different meaning to it. And the meaning of this one is the idea of carrying something, like putting it on your shoulders and bearing up the weight. It's the idea of bearing something. So you could literally say that they couldn't fulfill or carry the order that was given to them. And this, even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Among the other orders that were given to them, the picture here is of the Ten Commandments type of deal. You can't keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. I hate to tell you that. You can't do it. Try as you might, you won't be able to. So we notice that word endure here. You couldn't bear it up. A little side note, though, I, I wanted to throw this in because I, I actually I text Bo about this um, earlier in the week. Sometimes, you know, I, I'll stand up here and I'll say something like, you know, this word isn't the same word that's over there. And I, I know what it feels like to feel like that's kind of scary. Like, well, how can I read and understand what's going on if I read the word over here and it means one thing and over there it means another thing? Please don't feel like you have to have a degree to understand the Bible because you don't. The Holy Spirit is inside you. It does take digging, but I assure you the things that I'm doing here to find this stuff, anybody can do in here. I go online, I use blueletterbible.org to look up Greek words and stuff like that. I use, and anybody can get on that. I use biblehub.org uh, to look at things. So anybody can do this here. Anybody can pull these out. You just have to do a little bit more digging. So the encouragement there is I don't want anybody listening to be discouraged when they hear about words that are the same word in English that have a slightly different meaning. Um, so just notice that and note that um, digging is required. That's what I put down there. So the second thing to notice, we had the first thing is the endure. The second thing real quick to, to notice is the approaching of God in this mountain setting of Mount Sinai. It meant death. There was separation of God and man on full display at Mount Sinai. You've got his power displayed, and then the order that's given. If anybody touches this mountain, anything touches this mountain, kill it. It's dead. Separation. I can't think of any more separating a thing than that. You know, if, if you cross this line, you will die. It's about as harsh as the line can get. Let's keep going. It says, indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Deuteronomy 9, 19, and this is Moses writing. He says, for I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure that the Lord bore against you. He's speaking of Israel, the people of Israel, so that he was ready to destroy you. And, and I can imagine Moses being the leader of the people was probably thinking, well, I'm the leader, so I'm going to end up going with them probably. So Moses was trembling at these, these displays of God's majesty uh, and his holiness and the order that came. So two quick thoughts that come from that. Even Moses, the mediator, was afraid of God in that moment. And, and at that point in time, it was God to Moses to the people. Then Moses would tell the people, and then he'd go back to God, and God would say something to Moses, and then go back to the people and tell the people. So the mediator, if you will, the guy who was in the good favors of God in that present time was afraid and terrified of what God might do to him and the people. Secondly, this is just an interesting note, kind of going to New Testament a little bit here, but Moses was one of the people that the religious elite, like the Pharisees and all of them, would point back to and go, you know, well, we follow Moses, you know, we're not following you, Jesus, and and it's so funny because here it is, Moses saying, I'm afraid of the Lord. You know, I have reverence and show awe to the Lord. And these people who are following, saying they're following Moses, aren't 
paying attention to that key point of the fact that Moses was following something else himself. Silly, silly, silly. Um, uh, let, let me give you this passage real quick in this illustration. You remember uh, the blind man that was healed? Jesus heals this blind man, and the religious rulers find out about it, and they, he, you know, he's saying things about Jesus, and they put him on trial, and, and he's like, you know, Jesus is, is wonderful and great and did all these things, and they, they say this to him. They say this to him. When he tells them how great Jesus is for, for doing what he did and healing him, this is John 9, 28 and 29, the Pharisees and the, the leaders say this, and they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, talking about Jesus, you are Jesus' disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, talking about Jesus again, we do not know where he comes from. You know, after he sat down in the temple and opened up the book uh, of Isaiah and said, hey, in this day, uh, the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. You know, mic drop, I'm here. And they still are saying stuff like this. So let's, let's come back for a second here. I want to get the forest one more time. We've looked at trees. You still with me? You're not dead yet? I haven't killed you guys with just random knowledge here. It's not random knowledge, but you know what I mean. So we back out. What's the author trying to say in this little section? Well, first thing, you really didn't want to come to Mount Sinai. Like, it was a bad place to be. You, you kind of wanted to stay away from Mount Sinai. You know, it was like on fire and stuff and quaking and death and whatnot for touching it. So you didn't want to come to Mount Sinai. It's kind of like when mom says, you know, go see your father, go see your dad and tell him what you did level of like not wanting to go it's like you know go see your dad and tell him what or, or the vice versa it could be maybe dad's telling you to go see mom and tell her what you did and you're just like oh this is the worst trip on earth i don't want to go do that magnify uh, magnify that times 10. okay so second thing to notice is they hadn't come to mount sinai that's the thing that it's easy to kind of drop if you don't continue to carry the first phrase over in the verse, they hadn't come to this point. The readers hadn't come to Mount Sinai. He's telling them about Mount Sinai and the place that they haven't come to. They come to a different place. And it's important to note here, though, this is very important to note here, is that God at Mount Sinai is not a different God than he is right now today. There was some different protocol that was carried out at Mount Sinai than we have today, but he's still the same God. He's still the same holy, just, wrathful against sin God. But there we have Jesus now. We have other things that stand in between him for us. So if they hadn't arrived at Mount Sinai, if they didn't come there, well, where did they come? Where did they get to? Well, we're going to find out now in verse 22 and 24 through 24. I call this one, first of all, I, I think I forgot to tell you what I dubbed that section. That was the mountain of terror and separation. All right, so we just looked at the mountain of terror and separation. F fire mountain. This is the mountain of peace and forgiveness. All right, so it says here in verse 22, but you, let's see how much time I have. All right, we're good. We're good. I promise I won't go over and keep you from lunch. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word, than the blood of Abel. So let's look at a couple little pieces here. He says, but you have come to. Huge pivotal moment in the text. This is very important. He says, you have come to, number one, Mount Zion. And then he throws in the city of the living God. And then he throws in the heavenly Jerusalem. Three different, what well, sounds like locations, right? It gives us three of them. Well, it's three locations with one meaning, all right? So don't get bogged down in all the location stuff because it's three locations with one meaning. And, and this location is a picture of perfected Jerusalem. 
This is when the believers are all gathered together in perfection, adoring and praising God, and, and unrighteousness and sin is, is no more. So this place can't be touched right now. The church, we, we, you know, we have a physical location right now, but the church is everywhere, right? The church is each one of us, each believer. The church, it, we gather together, but it's everywhere. So Mount Sinai, you can still go touch Mount Sinai right now today. Remember I was talking about, you know, you can touch it, just keep that in the back of your mind. Well, today you can still go touch Mount, well, you can, you can try to touch Mount Sinai. They don't exactly know where it is, but they got like a bunch of different places they think are Mount Sinai. So you could probably, you, if you go touch all of them, you're probably going to have touched Mount Sinai at some point. So, but you can do it. You can't touch this mountain right now. So this is a city, too, of peace and rest. That's the picture that's being given there when he says you've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. This is this peace and restful state that we get to. So you have come to this, he says. Next little section here says, but you have come to, I'm going to continue that phrase out through this passage again, but you have come to innumerable angels in festival gathering, great party angels, right? That's like, that's the first thought that came to my mind when I read that. I was like, what do I do with party angels? <laughs> What does it mean when he's talking about you've come to innumerable angels in festival gathering? Well, ask yourself this question. Why are they in festival gathering? Why are they rejoicing? And I'm going to leave you hanging on that one. You've got to follow along with me. I'm going to leave you hanging on that one. Let's go to the next one. But you have come to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven or in heaven excuse me i can't talk so at this point i was like ah yes the assembly of the firstborn my favorite assembly what does that mean <laughs> when you read through this you get hit with so many machine gun things that you're just like what does that mean what does that mean and then finally you get to a thing where jesus's name pops up and you're like oh thank goodness some some familiar territory i understand so let me let me break this one down just a little bit here the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven well the word assembly is the word for church all right ecclesia greek church all right they're believers enrolled in heaven. So you could say, for you have come to, or but you have come to, the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. So these are believers who are enrolled in heaven. Perhaps calling back to, giving a nod back to chapter 11, which was the hall of faith, if you will, the hall of fame and faith. Potentially those people, possibly. Possibly speaking of Jesus. I saw some commentators saying Jesus being the firstborn so his assembly, his group, his people. Um, but you have to notice this point. The readers have become part of this, all right? They're not just watching from the sidelines. You have come to this place, this group of believers. And keep going. Let's keep going. But you have come to God, the judge of all. All right, we're getting a little more familiar again, right? Not so off-the-wall sounding in Bible words, right? We're getting a little bit more familiar. What, what does this mean? So I got a question here. Did the people at Mount Sinai, Israel, did they actually come to meet God when they, when they came to it? Like, did the people come to meet God? Did they, did they want to meet God when they came to Mount Sinai? They did not want to meet God when they came to Mount Sinai. They wanted someone else to meet God for them. Moses, you go do it. We'll stay down here where hopefully it's safe and we don't get, you know, like burned alive by the fire mountain uh, or blown away by the, the, the winds and whatnot that were there. So, just lost my place. Cool. Hang on. I'll get back to it. Ah, here we are. I knew I should have spaced this thing out more. So they, they didn't want to meet him. They didn't want to meet him. So now here we are being said that God, you have come to God, the judge of all. Well, now fear is gone 
and communication is open between God. Do you see what's happening there? It's the converse, convex, whichever is the right word there, of what was said in the last one. Believers now have an open line of communication to God through... I'm going to leave you hanging one more time. I'm going to tie the loose ends, though, I promise you. Continue. This is how I get you guys to pay attention. <laughs> and myself, for that matter. Let's look at the next little section. All right. But you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And we go, ah, back to familiar words of Jesus being the mediator of the covenant. I understand a little bit now of what's being said. So what is being said here? This is really the pinnacle of the section, really, if you will. The pinnacle of the mountain. Mediator. What is a mediator? Well, it's defined as a person who intervenes or stands between to, to either restore peace and friendship or form a compact or ratify a covenant. Right? So Christ steps in to mediate between you, us, and the consuming fire that is Mount Sinai and God's holiness and justice. The new covenant, I gotta, we got to talk about that real quick for a second too. Jeremiah 31, verses 33 through 34 say this. This is the new covenant explained. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in them, within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. For uh, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And here's a key point in this verse. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Jesus is the one who endures, who bears up the order that was given at Mount Sinai that the people couldn't, that we still can't keep up. And that is in the fulfillment of the law that was given. All of those law things, you can't keep all those. You just make yourself crazy trying to keep all those. But Jesus comes in and does it perfectly for us on our behalf. Very important section of the verse here. Let me keep going, and we'll kind of touch on these again. I've got some points here I want to give out at the end of this, but... Keep going. But you have come to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Kind of another section of the verse that's like, what does that mean? All right. Abel's blood. Think with me for a second. Abel's blood. Remember Cain and Abel, right? Cain kills Abel because he's jealous, basically, of the sacrifice and just, just kills him. Okay. So Abel's blood cried out what was for most likely justice from God. Jesus says, you know, God came and said, you know, where's, where's Abel at, Cain? And he's like, what am I, my brother's keeper? And then he's like, I hear his blood calling out to me from the ground. He's like, essentially saying, I know what you did, and there needs to be a payment for this. Now, what does Christ's blood say, though? Because that's what's being talked about here. It says the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So Abel's blood was saying something along the lines of, Justice needs to be served for what has happened. Well, Christ's blood cries out in payment to God. It pays your penalty. Payment for what? Well, payment for sin's past, sin's present, and sin's future. It's payment of the wrath that you deserve for those sins. Uh, have you ever had a sibling take a punishment for you that you deserved? Or someone in your family? Like, you know, has your brother ever taken a, a pain? See, like me and my brother, I never took anything I didn't have to take. He, he usually deserved it anyways. I guess I deserved it the few times I got it. I was such a good kid. Um, I wish he was here right now. He would laugh. He would probably say something right now out loud in the audience if he was here. Um, so, so it's that idea of someone stepping in and taking something that you deserve. Well, Jesus' blood is saying, I've done that for you. I have stepped in. I've taken the penalty for you. So 
And one other thing real quick, too. The Old Testament sacrificial system is perfectly fulfilled in Jesus. That's why it's talking about the sprinkled blood. Remember the, the priests and stuff would sprinkle the blood and they'd have to kill the lambs. Well, you know, if it wasn't for Jesus right now, we would still be cutting up lambs on an altar for our sins. And I don't know about you, but I'm really thankful that we're not doing that still today. Because, you know, that's a lot of lambs. Let me tie up those loose ends real quick, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give a quick pan out real quick, and then a conclusion. And I think we're right on time with it. So let me tie up the loose ends. The party angels, all right? You probably won't forget that for the rest of your life. <laughs> why were they rejoicing? You can probably answer the question now. Why the angels were rejoicing? They were rejoicing over what Christ's sacrifice did for mankind. And the people who have accepted Christ at their Savior, there's a place in the Bible somewhere, I can't remember where, but it talks about the angels rejoicing when someone comes to know the Lord. So the, they're rejoicing over the fact that Christ has paved the way and that people are accepting it and coming to know him and being in a restored relationship with God, the same God who is the fiery, consuming mountain. There, that is possible to be restored in a relationship with him so there that's what the joy is about and it's picturing just happiness right mount zion is a place of happiness peace joy happiness um let me tie up the other loose end real quick god being the judge of all and the believers with the open line of communication well what's the open uh, line of communication through the answer anyone jesus it's Christ and his sacrifice. So you come to God, the judge of all, through Jesus and his sacrifice. And you are restored in a relationship with him through Jesus. Whereas before, fiery mountain of death, you can't come to God because you'll be burned up and consumed. So what is the author trying to say in, in this second section here? First thing, you really want to come to Mount Zion. You don't want to go to Mount Sinai, but you really want to come to Mount Zion. Secondly, Mount Zion and all its goodness is built on the atoning work of the cross. All right? If it wasn't for the cross of Christ, Mount Zion would not be Mount Zion. Third thing. You have come to this place if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because that's the whole point of this. Remember, you know, the verse, the two sections plays, you have not come to. And then it says, you have come to. Well, he's talking to the readers. You have come to the church. He's talking to the church. You have come to this point. You have come, if you've accepted Christ, to this mountain. And what a joyous thing it is. Us today, we have come to that mountain. If you've accepted Christ, you haven't come to Mount Sinai. Final thoughts here. You guys still with me? All right, final thoughts. I've got two thoughts and two questions, and they're going to be quick. So buckle up or hold your hat or whatever. First thought. As a believer in Christ, I don't have to cower before a God who wants to crush me in my sin. Right? Let that sink in for a second. As a believer in Christ, I don't have to cower before a God who wants to crush me in my sin. Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Go to verse number 2. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free. In Christ Jesus, from the law of sin and death, from that Mount Sinai experience. One other verse here, 2 Peter 3, 9. For uh, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's the God we serve. That's the God that's, that's living right now. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. He wants all to come to Mount Zion and not go to Mount Sinai. Second thought here. 
if you refuse to meet God at Mount Zion, you will meet him at Mount Sinai. Fire, tempest, the begging of the words to stop coming into your ears. Let that truth sink in for a second. It's a very sobering truth. If you refuse to meet God at Mount Zion, you will meet him at Mount Sinai in judgment. So let me ask two questions now. Actually, let me read you a verse real quick. 2 Peter 3.10. This is the, the next verse. I, just, I read you, the Lord not wishing any should perish, but all should reach repentance. Well, the next verse says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And the idea of exposed there is not like a dumb luck find, like, ooh, I found it. No, this is like a purposeful finding of these works. Everything that's done in the earth will be exposed, and it will be burned up one day. So that's the, the, it goes along with the idea that if you don't meet God at Zion, you're going to meet him at uh, Mount Sinai in judgment. Um, okay, so first question here of the two. Christian, are you living your life in the reality of coming to Mount Zion, in joining in the joyful assembly, responding to questions and accusations against you? Are you living your life in light of Mount Zion, coming to that mountain, responding to situations in work? How about in the mundane of life? What does it look like for you? It's different for everybody, what it looks like and how you respond, because everybody's situation is different. <clears throat> Kids, in school, do you live in this reality if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you, do you think about that in your schoolwork? Following the instructions of your parents? There's probably some kids listening as well. School can actually be a joyful thing if you do it in Christ. If you, you know, obeying your parents can actually be a joyful thing if you do it in Christ and you keep the reality of what's being said here in your mind. Second question. This is to the unbeliever. What is stopping you from joining in the joyful assembly at Mount Zion? So I'll ask it again. What is stopping you, unbeliever, from joining in the joyful assembly. If Romans 6.23, which Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord, which is the free gift to Mount Zion, joy, peace, and happiness. If it's free, what is stopping you? Is it worth it? Whatever it is that's stopping you? Uh, think back just a couple verses to Esau. Remember, Esau gave up his birthright for the bowl of cereal, essentially, is what it was. You know, are you currently in, sitting there with your bowl of cereal instead of your birthright that you could have? So is it worth it? And then why is it worth it to you? And then what if it's actually not worth it? Uh, the next verse, and Bo is going to be speaking on it, but I feel like I have to throw it in here on this, this passage, is just, he says in the very next verse, after we finish all this study, he says, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. And then he's going to explain some things. Here's Mount Sinai. Here's Mount Zion. One, terror, judgment, commandments, Impossible to follow on your own. The other, joy, festivity, happiness in Christ. See to it that you don't refuse him who is speaking. <clears throat> Consider <clears throat> Christ and the gospel. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we uh, come before you today. 
I specifically hope that um, I have not muddied any waters for anyone in your gospel in these two mountains and these two choices. I, I pray, Lord, that in any uh, feebleness of my own, any unclarity that is, has been spoken, that your Holy Spirit would come in and fill in the gap for my shortcomings uh, as a fallible human being. Lord, we thank you so much for opening up the way to Mount Zion through Jesus Christ and not leaving us to be crushed under Mount Sinai's requirements and laws. Pray that you would stir up important questions in unbelievers' hearts that they might really think about and consider, what mountain do I want to meet God at? Help Christians, Lord, here to live lives that are saturated with the reality of coming to and being a part of Mount Zion. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, that anybody who is here who doesn't know you would and, and would like to would uh, seek someone out for clarification on the subject, get answers to their questions. We thank you so much for your goodness. Amen.